Hello everybody, welcome to another video. Today we're going to discuss about how you can combine AI Genie with NCP and focusing mostly on the observability side and system tables, which is really interesting. We have today with us Jay. So Jay, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thanks for having me here, Maria. Uh, I'm Jay. I'm also a senior SA at Databricks. Been here for about four years and uh, over the last few months, I've been super immersed in the world of MCP and everything that's happening in AI. So have an opportunity to work really closely with a lot of cool customers across the board. So really excited to dive in a little bit here. And before we do that, Maria, would you mind kicking this off and explaining what MCP is and why it's so exciting for the industry? Yes, thanks. So thanks for the pass. So if you are working, you know, with LLMs and you want to combine LLMs with tools, we didn't have a clear way on how to do that. And then Anthropic came up with this MCP, the Model Context Protocol. Now this protocol is adopted widely in, uh, in the developer community. And so what is the problem that it solves? So no, when the model interacts with tools like a database or an API or any other service like GitHub or Slack, you have to write a code to glue these services together. And this code, it's different. Everyone can write it as they want. So it was really different, difficult to maintain and sustain and grow, right? And you have to change it with every model. So if you wanted to change your LM, then you had to rewrite the code to interact with these different APIs. So this doesn't really scale. So what MCP does is it completely changes the way we work with all of these things because now we have an open and standard protocol to connect AI models to external systems. And this offers mainly consistency and it just allows you to build integrations one off and then just reuse it as you iterate in your projects. So it sim simplifies the architecture more or less. And so Jay, let's go back to what you've built. Can you explain a little bit the use case and why you build that? Yeah, I'll start a little bit from the top and then dive deeper into why I built this. I think a topic that's been super prominent, at least in the data world for the last few years and has become pretty tough to solve for is how do you create a semantic layer? So a semantic layer is a metadata abstraction that sits on top of your raw data where you can translate complex data structures into business-friendly terms and definitions. In the context of BI, semantic layers define consistent metrics and dimensions. Uh, so that way, any downstream user has a standardized definition of things like revenue or customer account so that you have a single source of truth. Well, now we've seen that through Genie, AI is starting to interact with our data. So that was sort of the vision is how do we think about this in the context of AI and LLMs, but where a semantic layer serves a similar purpose, where you're bridging the gap between the language of data and the language of business. But now you're having AI agents interpret and understand what that actually looks like. So how a user interacts with a semantic layer and how an AI, how AI interacts with the semantic layer is completely different. And what Databricks has done, I think, is really exceptional where you've created this natural language processing engine where you're super easily able to do text to SQL with Genie. And Genie now acts as the central point to your semantic layer. So now with Genie, you can have a standardized approach for any AI agent to go in and access your data and take actions on that data. So that's where, to your point, uh, Maria, MCP really fits in is now you have this standardized approach where you can go use Genie anywhere, right? It doesn't matter if you're using OpenAI, Anthropic, Gemini, any model or any provider that supports MCP will now be able to access Genie and use its semantic capabilities to do that. So, you know, coming forward, really built this to dive a little bit deeper into Databricks costs. Uh, it's a, a very important thing for a lot of our customers and it's customers. Question, right? How much am I paying? Yeah. It, exactly. And, and system tables, you need platform teams to dig into it. And and we have already have these pre-curated Genie spaces with all of the system tables data fit in. And now you can really prompt it. You can do a single prompt or we'll showcase a few shot prompt later where you can just tell it to build you the executive report right out of the box without really having to do much and letting AI do everything. Yeah, good point. So in Databricks at this point, we're logging in system tables everything that it is being charged, right? So what you are saying now is open all of these through Genie to everybody else. Yeah? Exactly, exactly. Okay, let's discuss a little bit the architecture of these and what's happening under the hood. Yeah, so under the hood, we're using, so we'll start with the client side. For the purpose of the demo, we'll show later today. We're using Cloud Desktop as, as the client because it's one of the only few that's natively adopted MCP, given that they're the creators, cursor, 
being the other one as other providers start to come out with it. So using Cloud Desktop as the client, we simply have an MCP server that actually exposes a lot of different things from Unity Catalog. So the things, if you don't know what Unity Catalog is, it's how you govern your data and AI within Databrace. So what it allows you to do is you can, on that MCP server, any function or data really uh, that you have through Unity Catalog gets exposed through that server. Uh, you can also start exposing other data assets like your vector search indices. Uh, and then lastly, Genie Spaces. So you have this server where I'm currently running it locally, but you can host it on Databricks apps or really elsewhere. And then just feed it to Claude via that uh, MCP protocol. And that's really, it's meant to be super, super simple. Okay. Should we go through the demo and then we can discuss about authentication and then we can deep dive into the diff different components? Sure. Let me go ahead and uh, share screen. So I I've set up here a project. I like to just call it my Databricks data agent because I think that's really the world where a lot of our customers and users will be going towards where I've sort of given it a prompt about, you know, you're an intelligent data analyst, uh, you understand MCP and Genie, and a little bit more context in terms of how Genie actually operates. So, uh, you know, some more context that's helpful. And then what we're gonna ask it to do is create a consolidated executive report that actually dives into the usage patterns uh, and cost drivers and operational efficiency and have it see if it's able to give us some feedback. So it does take a couple of minutes, about three to four minutes. So while it runs talking about, it's going to give us a, a total DBU consumption, cost breakdown by product, and then additional resource consumer information. And the way that it does that is actually, it looks first into all of the Genie spaces that are available, which I've given it access through defining it specifically through the MCP configuration file, and, and within which I actually have multiple Genie spaces that I've listed out. And the really other cool part is while it's going through this is it's actually able to talk across multiple genie spaces. So going back to the concept of semantic layers, you can have multiple genie spaces talk to each other and really have this cool agentic conversation going on. Amazing. And then what is the difference between all of these genie spaces? Like how have you segregated them? Yeah. So for this particular one that we're diving into for system tables. It's simply one genie space with, you know, a ton of different data. And you can even see what are the types of questions it's asking. And so the first question that Claude asks of genie is understanding what tables and data are available in the space. And it's even asking about the structure of the tables that exist. And then it'll keep going and ask, you know, create the message for show me total DBU consumption. I'll get the query results. It'll understand what that is and it'll keep going and, you know, sort of iterating and having this autonomous loop. But to your question, Maria, in terms of one example that I've tried is, let's say I have an ad tech customer that's who I'm really familiar with. They'll have data uh, associated with a lot of users, so such as profiles, campaign information, household information, segments of each of those individuals. And all of that data, all of those spaces actually has a ton of tables in it because user information is just not as simple as profiles or household information is just not as simple as, hey, this is the house, right? So it'll have multiple tables in it. And then you want to you know, understand propensity. You understand which campaigns are the most successful. And this avoids actually having a user or an analyst to go in and navigate across all of these spaces and you just have the AI, in this case, Claude, be able to do that for you. Okay, and then the architecture behind the scenes then is we have Claude as kind of the orchestrator, orchestrator LLM, and then it goes, hits the genie space, gets the result back, thinks, and re hits another genie space or the same genie space if the answer is not complete. Yeah, and uh, Genie Spaces at, uh, are powered by Databricks SQL warehouses. Uh, the data is governed through Unity Catalog, so oftentimes the, the question comes up is, is AI sort of going wild uh, here, or how do you prevent hallucination? So uh, it tries its best to be deterministic, and the way it does that is you're only providing it data that lives within Unity Catalog that you physically add into specific genie spaces. It should do a pretty good job of trying to avoid hallucinations um, and, and kind of going from there. And what about authentication then? <laughs> because yeah. that's a subsequent question. Yeah, the authentication 
gets managed at the server level. So it's at this point in time, it is managed by the user who is managing the server and creating it. Databricks apps is where we recommend customers host their MCP servers. And as a result, you need to authenticate to Databricks apps using OAuth uh, in order to have the most level of security. So that gives you that layer of authentication, but it, you have a little bit of flexibility there. Amazing. Cool. And then if we go on the MCP side, can you show us a little bit how you build the MCP tools and what is the benefit? Yeah. So let me, I'll go into the actual labs project that yeah. we have while Claude is still running and maybe we can come back to it and show what it actually comes up with the results. Amazing. So here. I'll just quickly dive into what MCP servers that we have available for Databricks right now. The Unity Catalog server, as I was referring to, and then we have another one under construction specifically around developer tools. So let me just quickly dive into the one for Unity Catalog here, where we'll get a, just a look into how do you actually create this? And it ends up being, you know, not very difficult because all you're doing as part of the server is just making certain definitions and abiding by the protocol. So all of this code that you're seeing will be generally pretty standard uh, across as you're creating the server itself. So the magic actually happens in the tool. So I'm going to dive into the Genie one here. Genie exposes its a conversational API to users now. And as a result, you have a few different things that exist within it. Starting a conversation, creating a message, getting the message, etc. And this is really where Claude operates. And, and then you can you know, see the rest of the code. But at a high level, Claude understands that these are you know the aggregate tools that it has access to. And how do I start the conversation? How do I get the result? And basing off the definitions that we've created here, it's able to operate and understand semantically, you know, what is the right tool to call. And obviously uses the context you provide in, it, in your own prompt to make sure it's actually not going to the right, wrong genie spaces as well. Amazing. Okay, good. And then a question, question that we can cut if we don't want to answer is, so, okay, what is the difference then of doing it and wrapping it as an MCP versus as a UC function or a tool in UC at this point in time? If someone is, let's say, fully on Databricks. <laughs> MCP has become or is becoming the standard protocol where once you have defined the server, you can take that server anywhere. So mm -hmm. the beauty of it is here is we still would recommend that you register the tools through Unity Catalog. And we actually have this as a tool that we expose to the server. So the, the workflow looks like you build and iterate and you still register the tool through Unity Catalog because that still gives you the layer of governance that you need to have in an enterprise setting within which any function that you do define or tool that you do define through Unity Catalog still gets exposed through what I'm showing right here with an MCP. So you still have kind of the end-to-end -end observability built in through Unity Catalog. And then you can take that and expose that through an MCP server and really take it anywhere for uh, platform class application usage. Amazing, thanks. And then, so as of now, you've showed how it can just go and query. What about the next thing, actually taking an action and, I don't know, turning off a cluster or revoking access to some tables? Is this possible at this point? We're working on it. It, it is a work in process. Yeah. So look out for that, you know, in the next couple of weeks, couple of months. That is the vision of what would be really, really uh, interesting and valuable for customers to have. Again, you, you want to make sure that the proper guardrails are set in place there. Right now, we get the proper guardrails through Genie and how you actually input the data and have all the access controls in. But we want to make sure that we're having safety in place and the right access controls in place, especially if we're giving it access to compute clusters and usage. So we're iterating and working on that. And over time, that is ultimately the vision that we'll have developer tools to actually interact not just with the data, but the platform and all of the APIs that exist within a workspace or an account as well. Amazing. Sounds uh, really cool what you're building. All right. So the report finished. Quickly going back to and summarizing the prompt, we asked it to create an executive report that dives into consumption, breakdown by product, resource consumers, and job. 
as you saw, it took about, you know, three to four minutes and it kept trying to, it did all of this by itself, diving into the data, coming up with information, looking at all of the data that exists. And then it created an executive dashboard with key findings that it has. We, you know, identified critical findings about daily consumption of our DBUs, what was the top cost driver workspace concentration, the monthly growth that exists existing within this workspace. And then, you know, you can keep diving into anything or whatever you would want in an executive report. Um, and it did all of this kind of by itself. And you can even go back into the actual workspace that exists and see what are all of the genie queries that it took. And then even gives, as you can see, recommendations uh, based off of what it already knows. So how do we optimize model serving costs? Because it seems to be about 50% of the usage in this particular workspace, vector search efficiency, job scheduling, and keep you know going there and there and there, and then even try to forecast what usage looks like. And really came up with a really interesting point of view, which again, would have taken any analyst many, many hours to create, but Claude was just able to do it in a couple of minutes. Really cool, right? I think this is what, Every one of our customers actually wants in terms of uh, understanding the costs and what is the most expensive. I mean, who is burning the most at this point? Yeah. Amazing. And then, so the repo is open. The repo, the repo is open, uh, Databricks Labs. Slash... Amazing. So we will link it. And then any final thoughts, any kind of best practices or future directions for... Whoever is watching I think the one thing I, I want to continue calling out is as a lot of our customers think about creating semantic layers, we're finally at, at the point where customers have gone through the bronze, silver, and gold journey, and now we're at like the diamond or the semantic layer journey where they're trying to get their data ready and improve for dashboards. But they should also start thinking about how this data operates with AI. So Genie is sort of the entry point to that. And then the, you know, the next piece of that is how do all of these faces talk amongst each other? And that's something I've been really excited about and playing around with is tons of data everywhere. And Claude or any other model that supports the MCP protocol is able to really dive in with the right context and generate these insights very, very quickly. So we're going to see a reduct, you know, an increase in productivity for all of our technical users in the community. I think we should have this as a tool in the Databricks platform, generate your report or something in the account console. Yeah, maybe we can put that as a feature request. Yes, amazing. Thank you, Jay. Yeah, thank you for having me.